So, hi everyone. Very welcome and very happy to see there's such a large audience today. Maybe you already know me as a, in my role as organizer and today I will take over the two roles. So, uh, my name is Anaï Kaldu. I will just briefly say something about me so that you know where I'm com where I come from, who I am. So I'm an astrophysicist. I did my bachelor and master's in Mexico. I, I, I am from Mexico. I come from Mexico and I studied there at the National University. And then I did my PhD in Germany, in Heidelberg. And after my PhD, I decided, I decided to go to science communication, like de dedicate my whole time to science communication. And I did a couple of uh, jobs at the University in Mexico, and I am here since almost two years in charge of the outreach of the Institute. And this is the first time I, I give the talk of Nachts auf der Sternwarte, so I'm very excited about that, and I hope you like it. And today it's a very special talk because we are working together with a unique music festival, so Masek, do you want to say a couple of words about it? Please use the mic because there are some people... Wait a second. It should work. And work? I think so. Okay, yeah, it works. So hello everyone. Um, my name is Maciej. I'm a project manager in the Polish Institute, but also this year I'm curating the music festival of Eunik. Eunik is a, a network of European cultural institutes and um, different embassies. So I'm really happy that we could uh, in, do like a kind of introduction to the actual festival, which you have the flyers on the tables. And um, the topic of the festival this year is, is uh, Revolutions of Heavenly Spheres. So, so we dedicate the festival to the uh, Polish-born astronomer Nikolaus Copernicus, which was born uh, 550 years ago. So our idea was um, to find the connection between music and astrophysics and astronomy, but also maybe some to find some imaginary um, views of musicians on the astronomy. So I'm um, really happy that will take place. Um, you're very welcome to join the concerts. Um, you can check all the concerts in the, in the booklet. And thank you very much, Christian Schinkel from Music University, the University of Music and Performing Arts Vienna for um, being with us and uh, participating in the talk. So I wish you a pleasant evening and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I will give the first part of the talk and then Christian will continue with the musical part, part, okay? So the topic today is the Voyager mission and we, I, I call it Voyager, our interstellar messenger, and we will see why. So first of all, oh, it's not working. <laughs> okay, it's not working either. So maybe it's because of, Zoom. Now it works. Wait. Uh -huh. Okay. So let's see if this way. Okay. So let's see. Yes. Great. So I was just, and I tried it before, but this usually happens. <laughs> Murphy's Law. So I hope that goes away soon. I, I still, I, ha I think I have to open the chat again. Sorry. This is the trick Alice showed to me. <laughs> and I hope it goes away. Yeah. So first, about uh, talking about space missions, the first question is always, how do we manage to take something out of the Earth? Because as you know, the Earth is very massive and it has a very strong gravitational field. So then if we jump, we fall. Like that's that's it, and the same happens with everything we throw. It's not working again. I don't know. Oh no. Okay. Okay. And why do we actually 
take the hassle of bringing something into space. No, we have telescopes here on Earth, so we can just say, okay, we can use these telescopes. But there are some advantages of having uh, telescopes or satellites out there to help us uh, in studying astronomy. First of all, our planet fortunately has an atmosphere because we can breathe. But for astronomy, it's very bad because as you can see here, a lot of the light is blocked. So all these brown thing is regions where you, we cannot observe the universe. This is the light our eyes can see. And it is not a coincidence that we can see this light, it, like our eyes evolved because that's the case, because this light reaches uh, the Earth. But then there's other places where we really cannot see anything. So if we go outside of the atmosphere, we can see this light that is there, but it gets uh, taken away by the atmosphere. Um, but wait, okay, this is wrong. Okay, I don't know what's happening. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Wait a second. Huh? <laughs> no, it's really, it's like, I don't know what happened in the presentation. I'm very sorry. Wait a second. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, yeah, I don't know what happened. I, I'm really sorry, so for actual folly. So going back of how we throw things out of Earth, it's going a bit in a loop, I'm very sorry. So as I said, if we jump, we come back, no? And if we throw something, we can imagine we have a ball, and then if we throw that, we, it, the ball will reach probably the back of, of the room, okay? If I throw it faster, and imagine we don't have buildings, trees, etc., we can maybe make half the way through the Earth. If we reach, if we manage to throw this at eight kilometers per second, it will orbit the Earth, our ball. It will keep, keep orbiting the Earth. And if we get to 11.2 kilometers per second, then our object will be able to to leave Earth, okay? So we need a very high velocity to achieve this. But even if we manage to get an object outside of the Earth, we have to imagine, imagine that the whole solar system is embedded in a stronger gravitational field. The sun is there, and the sun has much more mass than the Earth. So even if we take something out, the sun is going to pull all the time, to pull all the time, and this means that the satellites we throw outside will get slower and slower and slower each time because they are fighting against the, the, sol, the, the sun's pool. Okay, so when thinking about missions to study the solar system, uh, it's very tricky because I love this picture here. It's actually in two in two rows because it's very hard to have it in one row. If I show it here in one row, these are the distances between the planets in our solar system, like the real relative distances, no? So if here we have the sun, this is Mercury, Mars, the Earth, uh, Mars, Mercury, Venus, uh, the Earth, Mars, they are points basically in our computer. We cannot see anything, okay? So that's why I put it here in two rows so that we could, could see it more clearly. And the distance to reach Neptune, for example, is huge. Neptune is here. Imagine we already think Jupiter is far away. And if we look, if you look at this picture, it's like very close in the end, not to the Earth. So if we wanted to take a, a spaceship out of the Earth with enough velocity that it counteracts the, the gravitational pull from the sun, and we wanted it to reach Neptune it would take 30 years. So imagine you're a scientist and you want to ask the government for a lot of money to go to Neptune. And you tell the government uh, in office, yeah, so please give me the money and it will take 30 years. And this is the first time we try it, no? So I hope it works, but it will take 30 years to see if we manage it. It's very likely that you will get a no for an answer. 30 years is a very long time. But there's something great, gravity. And there's a, a technique 
that is called gravity assist. And already in the 70s, uh, the first studies were used to, to use gravity assist to, to use the Mariner mission to go to Venus and to Mercury. And what does this is actually? So gravity assist changes the speed and the direction, direction of the spacecraft. So imagine we have the spacecraft and then it goes close to Mars and then Mars pulls it away. And if we use the spacecraft in the direction of rotation of the planet, it accelerates. And if we use the other direction, it decelerates. So basically we can use planets to change velocity. And of course, if we have a bigger planet, the pool is going to be larger than if we have a smaller planet. So this is gravity assist. We use a planet or a massive thing out there that pulls our spacecraft and then it sends it flying in the direction we want, if we make the calculations very precise. Okay? So that's great. And there was this uh, guy called Gary Flandro who was a, a graduate student, and he was told, okay, we want to go to one of the giant planets. Can you see if we can use gravity assist to achieve that? And he was working on that. And usually when you hear this phrase, the stars aligned, that's terrible, right? Because stars have no influence in our life. But in this case, the planets aligned. Gary Flandro discovered that the planets were placed, would be placed, precisely so that you could use the gravitational pull of Jupiter to fly to Saturn and from Saturn to fly to Uranus and from Uranus to fly to Neptune. So with this short video, you can see a bit how it would work. No? So the spaceship leaves the Earth, goes to Jupiter, Saturn, then uh, Uranus, and then Neptune. And the whole trip would only last 12 years. So that's less than half of what, or, uh, of what it would take originally. The thing is that also Gary Flandro discovered in this year that this configuration would not happen again in 175 years. So it was either we do it now or in 175 years, which is even longer. <laughs> like if you cannot get money for 30 years. So then uh, NASA went for it and they started working on the mission in 1972. And the, the mission at the beginning was called Mariner Jupiter Saturn mission, okay? And this is one of the first pictures and I also like to show it because of two things. I want you to notice two things. One is the fashion of the time, no? Like you can notice it's really the 70s, like the big uh, ties and uh, hairdos and everything. But what's the other thing you notice? No women. Zero, okay? And it's not that there were not women working on this type of missions, they were not, they, they were not on the picture, you know, they were behind screens. And fortunately this has slowly changed. So now actually the Voyager mission is still ongoing and the project director at the moment is a woman, but back then it was really hard, okay? So just to have in mind that it's been a tough way Women have always been there, but sometimes like being on the front row and getting the recognition for the work we do is not so easy. And then, I, I mean, the, the epic name was born in 1977, no? The Voyager, and this is the, the badge for the mission with a, a giant planet. So it was really everything set up to start. And I mean, Nowadays, we are used to seeing rocket launches all the time, but I will still show this one because I find it always very amazing how we can actually do it. And you can see here that the Voyager 2 started first than the Voyager 1, but the names are in disorder, so to speak, because one would, uh, Voyager 1 would reach uh, uh, Jupiter before because of the route it took, okay? And as I said, I mean, we're used to seeing launches, but also nowadays we see failed launches, not just a couple of weeks ago, the Starlink didn't work, no? So it's really hard work. And if something small doesn't work, it's gone. And uh, for the, f f the, the, the fuel to get the, the rockets going was seven tons of fuel. 
That means filling up 20,000 cars, just so that you have a, 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 an idea of how, how much fuel it is. And that fuel was just to reach our friend Jupiter. Because then from Jupiter on, gravity assist would make the rest of the work, okay? Just so that you get an idea of how this gravity assist worked, uh, if we start from the Earth, the, so the, 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 the rocket left the Earth with 36 kilometers per second, which is much higher than, than the 11.2 I told you you need to get out because of the sun's pool, etc. But then when it reached Jupiter, because of this, so the sun pulling, its speed was only 10 kilometers per second. So you can see how much speed it loses in its way. Then it left Jupiter with 18 and so on. No? It reached yeah, Saturn with 16, then 34, then 21, then 24, then 21, then 29. Okay, so that you get an idea of how this gravity assist works. And then the magic started happening. Voyager started sending pictures. So this is the first picture from Voyager 1 uh, from September 6, and it is the first picture ever of the Earth and the Moon together. Now we're also very used to going on internet and finding ama amazing pictures, but this was the first time that one, I mean, if I want to take a picture of you, I have to walk, walk, walk this until you, all of you are in the picture. So that's why it was so hard to get this picture. And you can see that the quality is not great, but at that moment it was revolutionizing. And actually these pictures, these first pictures, uh, helped in the Earth to also create a environmental movement and think of our place in the universe because you really get humble by seeing what it is no, to, to live in this planet. Then in 1979, this is Voyager 2, approached Jupiter. So these are pictures not taken in, in, in series and then it's a video in the end and this was the first time that it was really observed that this red spot on the planet is actually like a cyclonic uh, storm and that the stripes Jupiter has move one, uh, like the, the white ones move in one direction and the other ones move in the other direction. And this was, so Voyager did a lot of firsts, no? It was a really amazing mission. And this, here I'm cheating a bit because this picture is not from Voyager, it's from New Horizons, a much modern uh, probe. But uh, one of the findings of Jupiter was the first volcanic activity outside the Earth. Okay, so that is, that is Io, one of uh, the moons, and this is, you can see here the plume. So. And this is a nicer picture of the uh, giant, uh, giant spot because I, I love it and it's really amazing. But it's also for a, from a different mission, Juno. Another discovery from Voyager is that in Europa, uh, Europe, no? uh, I don't know how to say Europa in English. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was discovered that there's water. All these tribes is because the, 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 the moon is so far away that it's frozen, but then the ice breaks and then it covers uh, the moon with these tribes of uh, ice, broken ice. And then in 1980, 81, we got the first images like so close from Saturn rings. As said before, now you can really find mind blowing images of Saturn rings with uh, space telescopes, but this was the first so close up image of the Saturn rings with so much detail that what one what could, could really study uh, the, the, the stripes and the spaces between them. And also from Saturn, uh, Voyager discovered the first thick atmosphere in our solar system apart from our own. So th this was also a great discovery because we are always thinking about finding life outside there and for that we need an atmosphere. So it was, this was really great to see that other bodies are able to have atmospheres in reality, to observe them. And then in 86, the Voyager visited Uranus. So actually Voyager 1, one went after visited, so uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and then it started flying outside the ecliptic. So the plane where all the planets are, but then the other one went to Uranus for the first and last time. 
we have not sent anything else to Uranus. So this is the closest we have been to the planet ever since. And the pictures from Uranus usually are very boring because it looks like a ball, no? Like, okay, yeah, very interesting. But uh, the Voyager also discovered that Uranus has rings. And then with other images, I mean, also from Uranus, but this is also cheating because this is from Keck, an Earth telescope that is observing actually in the infrared. So we can see very clearly that Uranus is tilted. So all the planets are uh, rotating in one direction and then Uranus is like on its belly, you know, like doing <laughs> like this. And actually the JWST and the new space telescope just took a much nicer picture of Uranus where you can really see in very great detail all its rings. So this is what I mean. Now with space telescopes, we can achieve maybe much more than what Bojager did, but it did it for the first time and it was amazing. And then, so 1989, Neptune, the Bojager 2 last stop. So this is again, the only time in which a probe has been close to Neptune, the last planet of our solar system. And what shocks me to think, like the first time I thought about it, it's like after the Voyager visited uh, uh, Neptune, it turned its cameras off. Because never, never again, the Voyager will be close to something. So it cannot take a picture of anything else because it's just there in the middle of empty space. And if you think about that, it's really like, wow, no, like when you really think of being there in the middle, like for me, it was scary a bit. And here is a, an image so that you can have a, a scope of really how the, the trips were. So as I said before, the Voyager 1 just went to Saturn and then it started flying away from the plane of the planets. And then Voyager 2 did the whole trip. And then it started flying also a, a, away from the plane of the planets. And the Voyager 1 still had its camera on. It waited until 1990 to turn, well, the, uh, NASA waited until 1990 to turn it off because of the same reason. But Voyager took this series of pictures of the whole solar system. No? So these are all the planets seen from Voyager in 1990. So, here is Jupiter, Earth, Venus, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And from this picture, we have this very famous. So this very famous picture is from this series of pictures. I'm sure you have heard about the pale blue dot. So I don't know if you see this point here. That's the pale blue dot. That's the Earth. Okay, that's the Earth seen from the Voyager. And this was also an image that was a shock for the Earth because it's really like everyone, everything, all the history of the Earth is that point there, okay? And then the Voyagers continued traveling until they reached interstellar space. So that's why it's our interstellar messenger because it's already in, in the interstellar space. So here is the solar system. The solar system has is within this kind of bubble, and this bubble is where the sun has a lot of influence because of the solar wind. So the particles of the sun here are dominating everything. But outside the solar system, there's gas too. The thing is that, that this gas is very, uh, it's not very dense. And our solar wind is much denser until it reaches the termination shock. So the termination shock, this place here, is where uh, the interstellar medium, the gas outside there, is similar to our to the gas from our sun, and then they compete with each other, so to speak. They are able to compete with each other. And uh, I mean, there's all this uh, space that still is like uh, the, 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 the area of influence, but after the, you cross this line here, you're really in interstellar space okay the sun there has no influence in terms of magnetic or electric field uh, okay and i mean it looks like a bow because our whole solar system is moving so that's why it has this shape okay and 
it was measured from by the Voyager. It's not just like we are telling here a nice story. These are actual measurements from Voyager 2 in which you can see uh, the particles it's measuring. So here it's uh, the heliospheric particles are par particles from the sun. And these are galactic cosmic rays. So it's measuring both, it's measuring both. And then at some point, the solar particles go down it cannot measure them very much. And then the galactic cosmic rays go up. So this is really where you say, okay, we are entering interstellar space. It's measured, but with the instrument that Voyager has. And then you might think it already left the solar system, but it's not quite uh, right. Right now the, the Voyagers are around here. So these are all the planets. This is a logarithmic plot, so that means that these are orders of magnitude. No, this is 100, this is 1000. So it's really increasing a lot in that direction. Here we have what we call the Oort cloud, um, which uh, is a theoretical cloud that you cannot really observe because it's very small uh, uh, bodies and very dark. So it's not so easy to, stu to study the Oort cloud. And the solar system ends somewhere there, where, is, where the influence of the sun, gravitationally speaking, is really no, no longer important. But to reach like the edge of the Oort cloud would take the Voyager 300 years. So we're not going to be able to measure it because it's too far away. And then going to the last part of my talk is why messenger so we got the interstellar part already but why is it a messenger and it's because of these two golden records that the Voyager is carrying uh, they were uh, so the contents of the golden records were decided by a committee uh, led by Carl Sagan actually and each of the Voyagers has these golden records and what do they contain so they have uh, 100 Im 116 images and sounds. So imagine you are going to send something to outer space and you, uh, you have to decide on the contents. No? So here, for example, there's a mom feeding her baby. This is the solar spectrum. This is a house somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And then this is uh, like a, a couple no? trying to show how babies grow inside and a bit the sizes, but it's in centimeters, so it doesn't mean necessarily anything, no? And then some sounds. Can you hear? So what was that? An ape, yeah, like a monkey, an ape. Oh. Water, that's like rain. A baby crying, yeah. And a train, exactly. But even for us on Earth, it's hard sometimes to like, what am I listening to? No, imagine someone that doesn't even live here. And then there's great things recorded in 55 languages. Here I just put some of them for you to read. Uh, I mean, most of you speak German, so let's play it. <laughs> That's it. So here I'm going to be, this is a joke, okay? So from Germans, you would expect such a good thing, but then in Spanish, you would expect something nicer and it's the same. So. <laughs> Like super boring, no? These two are very boring. German, Spanish, very bad. But there's, there are some others that are much nicer, no? Like, for example, this one I find very funny. Like, friends from space, how are you all? Did you eat already? So it's like really inviting. The, so that's great. If you're interested, you can look to the, at the 55 language messages, and it, it's very nice to see. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And then how, to, how can they find out, like the aliens that find these Bojagers uh, probe, how can they actually listen to these things or look at the images? So on the record, you can see here, there's all the information you need. The decoder, it's this, that, this there, so clear, right? 
you see, you look at this, and so this is the representation of the lowest. Uh, so one of the transitions from the hydrogen uh, hydrogen atom of very low energy, and then if you know the time this transition takes, which is of course seven point uh, zero point seven ten to the minus nine seconds, common knowledge, then you can have your decoder and read the rest of the of the disk. <laughs> No, so if you are walking on, at the beach and then you find this, good luck. And then it goes on, no? like now you know the decoder, but here it's telling you how to actually reproduce the, 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 the disk. So it's telling you with all these uh, ones and zeros, because the la vertical lines are ones and the horizontal ones are zero, then it, it, turns, it tells you that you have to play the disc at 3.6 seconds per turn. And it's of course expressed this number here in terms of this basic unit, the decoder. And then for the images, so that was sounds, no? And how do we decode the images with this graph here? So a line takes eight seconds. So you have to, oh. <laughs> So yeah, it, uh, then it tells you how to interlace the different lines to create the image. And the, an image contains 512 lines. And then if you did everything right, you should see this first image. If you see it, then you're on the, on the, on the good way. And then you can see the rest. And then of course, there's a map for the aliens to find us. So this is the earth. And then the position of the Earth is shown with the position of 14 pulsars. And to know of which pulsar, so a pulsar is a, a very evolved star that is turning very, very, very quickly, and there, it emits a, a periodic signal. So to identify the different pulsars, we need to know the period of these pulsars, and it's written here with ones and zeros in terms of 0 0.7 time to the minus 9 seconds. So then if you find these pulsars in the universe, you can go to Earth. And with that, I would like to finish the first part of the talk just with this last thought, which you don't have to answer it now, but maybe this uh, helps you think how and what would you tell someone from a different world? Because in the end, this exercise of the Bojager is that. Okay, so thank you very much. And now I will leave the floor for my colleague, Christian. Thank you. Can you manage my yes. You can put this on. How is it, sir? Or I wish I would see you. Ah, okay. Now the other way. So these go on top of your ears. Ah, okay. okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. So, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to talk for the first time uh, at the astronomy domain because I'm a musician and and when Anoi and and me uh, met each other the first time some couple of uh, days ago uh, I met the bad joke that unfortunately I'm old enough to know all the TV series from the late uh, 70s and early 80s 
uh, like uh, Mond Basis Alpha 1 uh, called uh, Space 1999 or something like that, uh, Star Trek, and of course, uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Um, I remember sitting in front of the TV, very fascinated and astonished from all the pictures and images uh, presented by Carl Sagan. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I also had this. Okay. Ah. No, it's not working. Ah, yeah, I, I took it with, I take it with the mouse. And I also had this book, uh, Unser Cosmos in German, the series was called Unser Cosmos. And all these images from this book shaped and formed my childhood and inspired me. Um, I can remember the first Columbia Space Shuttle star launch, um, 1980, is it correct? Or something like that? 81? Thanks. <laughs> uh, it was postponed forever and ever for me in front of the TV. And so, yeah, um, I followed uh, the news, the rare newspaper articles about these images when they were published uh, from Saturn or Jupiter. I cut them out and, and collected them <laughs> or whatever. Um, but however, I became a musician and I'm a so-called acousmatic composer. That means that I produce music uh, for an acousmonium. This is a kind of loudspeaker orchestra or a loudspeaker array distributed throughout the performance space where you can uh, uh, get sound from every direction and 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 yeah, and listen to it in in front of it, or, or can walk around, or something like that. Um, and this, so I'm convinced uh, as a musician that you can also explore the space uh, via music. Yes, uh, in 2006, I made um, a solo project of mine, uh, 70 minutes. Uh, uh, a work with 70 minutes duration called the Kuiper Belt Project. And it was influenced from all this stuff I mentioned before. And it deals with um, the so-called trans-Neptunian objects. And it follows uh, the big orchestral work, uh, the planets from um, of Gustav Holst. Uh, from uh, 1914. Uh, Horst ends with the, the last movement, the Neptune. And when the planets end, so uh, my music began uh, uh, in, 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 in weiterer Entfernung von, von behind the Neptune orbit, yes. And in 2020, I started scribbling, and uh, I'm lucky to show it in public uh, uh, because there was the grand conjunction of, of Jupiter and Saturn. And yes, it influenced me, and all the pictures from my childhood are uh, floating into these pictures. Now I have this was the 10th. Uh, Scribbling, and now I have uh, 130 <laughs> drawings. But anyway, let's move on to the Voyager Golden Records. And as Anahi told us before, uh, some data about it. Um, on these discs, you can find several media data and the disk is divided into four sections in images, in greeting words, in sequences of sound. And the last one, uh, seven, uh, 27 music pieces. Um, yeah, there is, as you told us, wonderful that I have watched YouTube videos because of the decoding of the images, but it's very tricky. And yes, I'm thankful that you, you did it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, on the second uh, section, you have the 55 greeting messages in different languages. One of the, uh, them is from uh, Kurt Waldheim, who was the, the UN uh, General Secretary. One of them is uh, from Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter, the US President. This is a present from a small distant world, a token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so we may live into yours. Yes, and hello from the children of the planet Earth is spoken by, uh, I guess, from uh, Carl Sagan's son. Herzliche Grüße an alle. <laughs> Let's move on to the noise samples and sounds from Earth. Um, they take 12 minutes of it in 19 excerpts with over 50 noises in several categories like nature, animals, machine sounds, human, we heard baby cries, a heartbeat, footsteps, laughter and a kiss. Um, but let's begin from from beginning. <laughs> Volcanoes, earthquakes, thunder, wind and rain and mud bubbles. Animals like birds, frogs, dogs, horses, elephants and apes. <laughs> uh, machine sounds, airplanes, trains, cars, a rocket start, a tractor, a forge and uh, several tools from a craftsman. And there are also artificial sounds. There was a, a sound, uh, there was a, a commission to compose a little sound composition um, recurring to Johannes Kepler and this Harmonices Mundi uh, frequency uh, equations to our solar system. And we can find the Morse code and a sonification of a pulsar. And in addition, we can say there is a sort of evolution of transportation sounds. So the sounds are ordered and begin uh, with a horse or horse carriage, go on with um, a bike, a motorcycle, cars, and uh, will go faster and faster uh, and over airplanes and it ends with the launch of the Saturn V or 5, I don't know how we say V, 5, Saturn 5 rocket, thanks. And on the um, last section, we can find uh, 90 minutes of music samples and they're divided into several genres. And you can see in classical, in modernism, modernity, a little bit of jazz, a little bit of pop, as you can say that, but it's uh, just rock and roll. And a lot of stuff is from so-called ethno music, uh, music from, from China, India, Azerbaijan, Peru, New Guinea, Senegal, Australia, Bulgaria, and Javanese gamelan music um, is on that disc. And <laughs> how can we do that? Should I give it to the, but I have a replica with me. Um, should we give it to the? Yeah, please be careful. Uh, yes. Uh, it's from the Institute of uh, Composition and Electroacoustic. So please be careful. <laughs> and there are three uh, vinyls in the, in the box. So what does this message say us? For me, um, it has a lot to do with the significance and the valuation of music in the 70s. Um, the weighing uh, between the uh, several genres and there is a lot of um, high culture 
music on it. Um, in in former times, we 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 can say that is the music of the elite, and there is no popular music except Johnny Be Good from uh, Chuck Berry, <laughs> and Louis Armstrong uh, blues is. Um, yeah, I guess uh, Carl Sagan took this uh, classical music as a rep representation for mathematical relations. Um, so you can find very uh, sophisticated compositional work in, in this. And the ethnomusic is more than the, the, the whole feeling of our planet, the, more the, the emotion side uh, from mankind. But for me, it's a way too serious, this compilation. You have to say that this is a very curious and, and, and strange project at all, because uh, it wouldn't uh, be able in our days, because there are 10 people who, was respon who were responsible for the, the whole representation in music for the, for the whole mankind. And uh, I, I think that that wouldn't work today. <clears throat> and for me, as I said, is it a way to do serious? There are very few entertaining pieces. There is no popular music. There is no electronic music. There is no experimental on it. But um, how could it be nowadays? We have a rising and always improving technology. We have the internet, we have artificial intelligence, and we have much more cultivated electronic methods for recording and mixing and audio engineering. We have flooded our planet with popular mu music when we think about uh, Spotify. And I guess that that would be much more representative in our days uh, for such a project. And yeah, I think um, a more relaxed approach to compile a new collection would be nice. Uh, because there are so many genres uh, crew together and we have this, um, exper all these experimental forms. And you see that within 40 years, all these um, changes radically. But maybe uh, all the limitations from yesterday were a good way to look back at the development of our consciousness, I guess. So there are some assumptions and comparisons because I think uh, Carl Sagan uh, must be assuming the existence of a higher developed aliens <laughs> when, when he did this project. Um, but uh, yeah, the probability to be found and decoded is close to zero for my opinion. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and the next point is that Sagan himself is aware that our radio, radio broadcasts uh, travel much faster than the Voyager probes uh, and they overtake Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 in every second uh, with the speed of light uh, since we are broadcasting in radio format. So my conclusion is the golden records are not primarily for aliens, <laughs> but uh, they work as a mirror to look at ourselves in a certain way. But now this is my personally, um, my topic, uh, and I have the certain way uh, to look at music and sound with the so-called acousmatic approach. As I told you, I'm a, a cosmetic composer. Um, that comes from the Greek word akousma, uh, which means the auditory perception, translated as hearing <laughs> and sound shaping. There is a legend 
of the Pythagoreans called the acousmatic curtain. And it says that Pythagoras teaches his pupils behind the curtain. So they are, they are not, they are distracted from every visual sense and from his uh, facial expression and from gesturing or something like that. So that they must concentrate on the listening. And François Bale, a uh, France uh, composer, invited in the 70s at the same time like uh, Voyagers started, um, the acousmatic music recurring on that uh, legend. And he says that a loudspeaker is a curtain, is an acousmatic curtain from nowadays, because we can produce music without showing it visually. Um, and the music production is uh, distracted from uh, from the visibility and the, the the visible gestures musicians does. So we can concentrate on our ear. This is called fixed media music, and uh, you need a recording medium and a sound carrier, and the the output is pure music via loudspeakers, and it, it's called reduced listening. And as I said before, you need a performance room with many speakers, so you are concentrated and you are in your own cosmos of listening. It is said that acousmatics are a polyphony of the world because uh, everything is possible what can be recorded to use as musical um, elements. Um, acousmatics is a sound projection because loudspeakers are projectors and no um, Schallquellen. Um, don't know the word that. So, this, thank you. <laughs> um, acousmatics. Uh, a losing of the body and gaining the mind. And acousmatics uh, are a sort of sound measurement of the world between mathematics and numerology. And I, I, I posted this um, so called uh, flower uh, of, the, of life, the sacred geometry, as example, because you have just uh, one one element and this is a circle, but the position and the, uh, yeah, the, the Anordnung, the ordinary, the, so, yeah, is, uh, is, is loading the object with meaning. And we have the same in our world because we have uh, objective uh, measurements. And in music, we have the acoustic world where we can measure acoustical phenomena. And this is done by mathematics. But also, the, the numerology uh, loads up the, the whole system of objective uh, measurements with a certain uh, meaning. So the Voyager records represent for me a hyper acousmatic state because we have a sound recording um, encoded signals on the disks. We have invisible sound objects flying through space <laughs> coming as polyphonics from our world. But now this is a very important uh, point. It's inaudible. It's the most distant sound object from Earth. There is no transmission medium for the sonic. There is no sound projection possible. There are no ears. There is no one there to listen. So this is just the in, in, in musicology, we have the discussion between the absolute music and the program music, which is loaded with meaning. Um, and for me, the Voyager discs are a wonderful example that 
the, uh, the, the music on there is uh, the most objective work of art uh, or music. And when you want to be, uh, when you want to make a very uh, sophisticated work of art, I guess you compose something, record it uh, very fine and send it <laughs> through space. So you have the, the most objective word of art. It's a kind of pure existing. I mean, we can we can scan the surface of a comet or something like that, or a, a, another celestial body, and with with the record needle, and we have the same uh, res result. Yeah, it lets uh, acousmatic music is also a kind of philosophy and it's always a figure of thought. So we can think about the absolute itself uh, when nothing is there to listen. Um, and at the end, human sound has always to be interpreted uh, like any other measurement. I know, I, I guess in, in physics, you do this always. <laughs> And that leads to my ending conclusion. The Voyager Golden Records are a mirror of ourselves and show us uh, the level of our consciousness. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Oh. It is. Yes. Okay. So now if uh, any of you has any questions for either of us, you can just say to whom the question is directed and yeah, we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. So I would have, you said the uh, um, golden records are a mirror of ourselves, but I guess a mirror of ourselves in the 70s when it was launched. So if it was launched today, what do you think what it would contain musically? Or like, what do you think would be the mirror of ourself? What and if I may say something about that, if you remember the picture I showed of the mission, no, like of the uh, men there, I think the contents of the Voyager and in, are in the end also a reflection of who's choosing it. Like, mm -hmm. Even like putting like classical music and like that's the, that's a very Western view. Yes, yes, it's a very Western point of view. During that, your talk, I think the first prob problem would be like, how do we make up the committee that is going to choose the contents? I mean, in the end, the people who pay for launching the rocket decide, no? But like, mm. yeah. And, and much more with the technology of today. The 40 years in in improving our technology in music technology and studio technique and so on is is a very big step. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, could you maybe show one more time the music they did include? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have Chuck, Chuck Berry for an example of, of popular music. Do you know Chuck Berry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are young people with us. So the That's question is, when when, the, when will the sun stop pulling the Voyager? So already now the the so the gravitational pull decreases with a square of the distance. So it decreases quite fast, no? If if you're farther away, but as I mentioned, like uh, the influence of the sun really ends around the Oort cloud. So this cloud, I can show you quickly. The image. 
uh, here. So, I mean, so around uh, here, the influence of the, of the sun starts really, <laughs> gravitational influence of the sun is not more, no longer important. It's in the middle of the Oort cloud, but already here, like at, at this point, the Voyager is not going to be stopped anymore. So the Voyager now as it is, it's going to continue moving farther and farther and farther away. So at the moment already, it's impossible for the sun to pull it back, so to speak. Okay, yeah. So Yeah, so um, if I remember correctly, the scientists were kind of surprised by the sudden drop of the um, of the influence of the sun. Uh, right. Right, but the 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 when it hit the heliopause, it like suddenly dropped, and I think this this sudden drop was a little bit surprising do we is there an idea of what will happen once it reaches the Oort cloud because we will never be able to see it so what was surprising so i will go to i don't know if this works yeah but it's so it's easier like this uh, so about this plot so what was surprising actually so we expected that something with this would happen. So that was not that surprising. But what was surprising was uh, the, uh, some cosmic rays. So scientists thought back, back then that the cosmic rays, some cosmic rays were produced here in the, this termination shock region. So they thought that with this shock, the cosmic rays were produced. And what the Voyager is measuring actually is that the cosmic rays continue increasing and they continue increasing. So that was a first uh, way to see that these cosmic rays have a, an origin that is farther away from the solar system. So that was, for example, something that we didn't expect that it was discovered by Voyager. And what will happen with the, when it uh, reaches the Earth cloud? So yeah, we will not be able to observe it even if... So the thing is that the signal is getting each time uh, fainter because it decreases also like the, the strength of the signal decreases also with the surface of the of a sphere no so it really decreases a lot so even now and even when the Voyager was sent we had antennas to to receive the signal and then at the first at the beginning they thought Voyager would leave like right at the beginning they thought it would be a five-year mission then with this a, a alignment of of the planets they thought okay 12 years now it's been 45 years there. So each time that NASA has to control, construct uh, larger antennas and antenna systems to be able to recover the signal because the power with which it emits is like the power of the light bulb in a fridge. So it's nothing and it's so far away. So what's going to be tricky in the next years is to be able to recover the, the signal. So that was, I don't know if you saw on the news, like on the April 27, I think so, two weeks ago, Voyager made it to the news again because uh, they were going to turn off one instrument. So I don't remember which of the two. In one of the two Voyagers, one instrument failed from the beginning. So that means it has more energy because this instrument is not working from the beginning. But then in the second one, they were planning on turning off one instrument this year. And now they, they saw like the, 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 the engineers at NASA, at JPL saw that they could use, there's a, a, a safety mechanism to compensate for strong voltage changes. And they thought, okay, if it's been stable for 45 years, we can think that it's going to continue stable. So now they are going to use that energy uh, supply to, to leave it to, to, to be able to have all the instruments still function it 
functioning, functioning at least two years more. And then in two years, they have to see. So they might sta start turning off uh, instruments. The power supply, so it's like the, of a light bulb of a, of a fridge, what it needs. Ah, wh what is the energy source, you mean? Ah, so it's a, it's a, a radioactive, a, it's plutonium, yeah, that it's decaying. And each time also because of radio, radioactive decay gets decreases with time. So every time there's less and less, but yeah, that's what it uses, plutonium. Yeah, it's very small actually, the, the yeah. Uh, with the cosmic rays, um, they did not anticipate uh, the drop that did happen. So, but yeah. Um, so, how did they anticipate that it wouldn't just be uh, destroyed within these uh, cosmic rays? Yeah, right in the radiation, yeah. And also by any other cosmic bodies like they anticipated. So, about getting destroyed, it's always a problem with space missions because there's always the possibility that they get destroyed if they hit. Actually, leaving Earth is very complicated. Well, more nowadays, actually, because we have so much junk outside there that now you even have to calculate how to get outside without crashing with something. And solar particles, I mean, you don't have to wait for the cosmic rays. Solar particles can be very energetic and damage the system, but usually, like, there's a shield protecting the instruments. And, I mean, it can happen that something like if there's a, lo a lot of solar activity or something, it can happen that it gets damaged and then that's it. So look, and at this point, the cosmic rays, if it, it gets hit by one cosmic ray, it, it, does, it does nothing, no? Basically, it's not so bad. It's more if you have like a solar storm where you have a lot of particles hitting at the same time. And that's not very likely, like the particles are, you can see the number of particles per second, it's not that big, no? So the, the heliosphere particles is actually, so the scale is a bit different, that this plot might be a bit tricky. So here I said like the sun is more dangerous because it has more particles, no? So here's 25, 25 around, but the galactic cosmic rays is one per second that it measures and that that directly hits, it's very unlikely. So there was another question from there. Um, this is just a clarifying question. So apologies if you actually explained it and I just missed it. Um, why did the, uh, why, why did Voyager 1 leave sort of after Saturn? I think it was and turned off and sort of just went out into space. Um, and Voyager 2 continued on. And also, can you explain again what the ooh something cloud is? Yeah, thank you. So the mission was planned like that. Since there were two, two spaceships, they didn't have to necessarily do the same, no? The, 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 the way to Saturn and Jupiter was needed for both because they really need the pool to continue. But one mission was planned just to visit these two planets and then start going outside because you don't know, no? Like if one doesn't work or something, uh, you want to have, and then the idea was also to try to reach if everything happened. So the thing is that now we know, like seeing now we know, ah, it's 45 years, but that said, if it had lasted five years or 10, it would still be a success and they didn't, nobody expected more, no? And then the, the, the other one was planned to visit the four giants. So it was planned like that, to have just these two different missions. And actually it's also useful because they are flying now in different directions. So that also helps to measure, for example, this shock is not necessarily in the same place because nothing is spherical, no? So you have differences. So it's also a way to measure things in two different places. And
just um, follow up to that, was Voyager one then just slower to be able to get out of that gravitational pull and leave that leave in a different direction first, or how does that work? Yeah, Voyager one left the so you can see actually here the the dates. So Voyager one entered inter, interstellar interstellar space in 2012 and Voyager 2 in 2018, so six years apart. And it's because, I mean, it leaves the, once you leave the ecliptic, you are also going, you don't have so many things on your way, so to speak. So also the, the planets, the sun, everything, like it's spherical, but if you're in the plane, you're closer to this influence. If you're flying outside the plane, it, it's not such a strong pull in different directions. So the Voyager 1 left first, the, the ecliptic, and this actually always farther away. You can, if somebody has Twitter, you, there's even an account on Twitter that is called Voyager, and then every day or so it says like, I'm so far away, from, so it tells you all the time <laughs> how far away it is and stuff. And then the Earth cloud, so it's a, it's like a sphere, of uh, small bodies. So after Neptune, for example, we have also the Kuiper belt, which is, uh, you mentioned it with your music. Yeah, so uh, Pluto, for example, that's the, the, the most known example. So a lot of people are still sad that Pluto is no longer a planet <laughs> because now it's, a, it's a, a, a dwarf planet. And the thing is that where Pluto is, there's a lot of bodies of this size, more or less like Pluto or a bit smaller, even a bit bigger. No? And these are like uh, bodies that are uh, moving around, but like the asteroid belt, but outside Neptune. And this is, Kuiper belt is still a belt, but uh, what we think is that is that farther away, instead of a belt, there's like a sphere of these bodies that is surrounding the solar system and that is part of the formation process of the solar system. But I mean, I'm not an expert on that field, but I think we don't know much about the Oort cloud. But no? planets is directed to the birthplace for comets? Some pr pr comets are, are, are come from the Oort cloud, yes, yes. Uh, as the as the source for the comets reach the inner solar system on parabolic orbit. Yeah, so things come from farther away, and then you say, okay, there's a cloud of things that sometimes get pulled by gravity, and yeah, yeah. So you were talking about these velocities, eight kilometers and eleven point two. May you yeah. go back to the slide, and I just wanted to know what happens in between those two uh, velocities. Well, like in reality, you just crash with something because there's things, no? So if you are, um, it comes down. So if you if you're doing a parabolic, so if you're throwing something even directly to the zenith, not on top of you, if it doesn't have eight kilometers per second, it will come down. Ah, okay. Sorry, sorry. That, so this is the eight kilometers per second is the closest orbit uh, you can have, but then you can be in different orbits. So actually different satellites have different heights and each has a different velocity. So yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, did the team which built this code on the golden platform did they try to give it to another scientific team to see if it is solvable or did they just send it do you do you know i don't know <laughs> so i don't know there's people now that try to really look at it but you already have information no so you have background information I don't think so, but I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. To send it with uh... But the record players in the 70s were like this big, no? <laughs> it's as big as the Voyager, probably. 
and then you need electricity, so you would still have to explain them how to plug it in. Uh, well, it can be mechanic or... But you would still have to tell them how fast you have to, to turn it. And This is more... Yeah. Also. Yeah, like a gramophone, yeah. But I think it's like Christian said, like more as a message. I think it's something more internal also, like a wishful thinking. I don't know if you want no, you know, uh, you you guess like a gramophone, I think. Yeah, no, it's not a gramophone. <laughs> but that it is a very serious and strange process. Yes. I can repeat. Uh, I, I said this uh, very curious and strange project at all. The the records, yes, yes. The records are if the records are identical. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. They are identical. So, if you have further questions, we will be around. But uh, I would uh, like to tell you that as. Every time we ca we will visit now the great refractor. If you want to see it, if somebody has not seen it yet, no. And 